Hello and welcome to episode 23 of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. I'm talking today to Neil Pinder, Head of Product Design and Architecture at Graveney School, Tooting, London, about the value and meaning of architectural knowledge for secondary school students, ways to embed it in mainstream education, the value of widening access to architectural education to less represented groups, and the effects this might have on our built environment. And as you know from most diasporas around the world, breaking bread is one of the biggest things that we do. We sit down, we eat, we talk, we break, we share food. And once you're doing that, you understand your other uh, fellow humans and you're creating communities. You're not making just pods for people to live in and then move out and sell and for it to go up and down or wherever the, 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 the case may be. So that's why we need people with different mentality, different ideology, different uh, sense of community. A is for architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm talking today to Neil Pinder. Neil, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Neil Pinder. I'm a secondary school teacher of product design and architecture, and I'm passionate about architecture. And um, I've been made a professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture, and I'm a Reba, a Reba honorary fellow. Yeah, that was the, that was your latest gong. When that that came live yeah. only a few days ago, didn't it? Yeah, that came live only a few days ago, and I was so pleased. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a breaking news as well. So you're going to be the first to hear on, on on your podcast is that I've been invited to be a fellow of the RSA. Really? Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. So what what will yeah. that involve? I don't know yet. I mean, I've just got to make sure I've uh, crossed all the T's and dot all the I's. But, yeah, somebody nominated me for that, this fantastic guy called Jason Boyle, who um, I connect to, and he's one of only eight uh, nuclear architects in the UK. And I connected to him while he was out in uh, Zimbabwe or in South Africa one year. And uh, he invited me to Clubhouse, and then we've been friends ever since. And he was one of my supporters or sponsors, little did I know, for my, um, for my Reba fellowship, along with another uh, guy called Femi at um, HOK. Wow. Fantastic. What wonderful news. I mean, it's really yeah. nice that they're kind of recognising you for your work. And I, I guess that's... What would be really great is if we could, yeah, what do you do? I, this is, so, so obviously we've all been through secondary school, but the idea of te- most mm-hmm. people who come into architecture, including myself, even though I come from, a, my father was a designer, have, mm-hmm. I have no real understanding of architecture. I've never really encountered architectural design, what it means, what it does. So how does it work in secondary school? Well, do you want me to start near the beginning and then? Uh, yeah, I mean, how did you get there? How did you, how did you get to this point? Mm. Well, I had a really absolutely fantastic, amazing art teacher, and and a music teacher at the same time. So I was equally balanced in the sort of creative field. Uh, my art teacher, he was uh, the art director at the Crestus Theatre in West London, in um, Hammersmith. Mm-hmm. And my music teacher was uh, the music director at Bromley, uh, Bromley Parish Church, I think. And so both of them realised the talents of myself and my friends, who, it was a basically a normal comprehensive school, but it had passionate teachers in. And these teachers were, you know, they, they went to the best schools. And they happened to teach in the secondary school at the time, which was um, which had really good values. It wasn't. It had creative values. It had educational values, and so it was a rounded school, not one of the schools that you get now, which is more like a um, you have to go this way 
because of government plan or you go that way if you don't if you don't get the, if if you want the money so they were really creative and so my art teacher inspired myself he basically uh taught me how to draw how to see perspective and then when i did so i got really got i think i got GC, gcse i think it was at the time and so i got you know the top one of the top grades there and then he said you should do a level and i said yeah why not and i did it and and in doing that he basically gave me another dimension he inspired me and, and that's what you need you, you need people around you and you'll see all of the the some of the most famous people i remember seeing adele on our uh, summer walk ceremony she brought her music teacher up or a teacher up that inspired her and teachers have the sort of ability to inspire and bring out and make people into our uh, superstars even if they don't know they're doing it at the time and this is what this i'm not a superstar by the way and this is what this teacher did and um so my parents were my dad was a, a carpenter my mum was a nurse but they came to the england you know as as most afro caribbean are uh, parents came just to earn money send money back home and um and do the best for their kids and coincidentally they had twins which was me and my brother you know and um so from there on uh he really was the beginning because he opened up so many doors and he said no why don't you you know put a portfolio and go to Camberwell and I was remember and at Camberwell Art School and I remember my said to my dad I want to be a, a, an artist and my dad looked at me like if I had five heads not three you know five heads like but, but how can you make money being a being, being an artist you know you've got to be a doctor lawyer accountant i mean i never had the brain capacity to be a doctor so that was out the way me and mass never got on <laughs> and you know um me and english we just about had a relationship <laughs> but me and art and music was was we had this bond and uh and so he helped me get a portfolio together to go to Camberwell School of Art and i remember the first week there i was the only black guy in the whole year and it was like a finishing school and it was like learning stuff like you know you saw these rich girls because it was girls they were one side where we was in the annex doing the foundation and they were doing book binding and now if you said to a kid on a council say oh you fancy to doing book binding they'd look at you and think what what the hell is book binding you know but these kids knew what it was and they you know they could carve out a profession at a book binding and then you met so many different kids who were middle class kids who were uh, knew all about Matisse they knew all about Cezanne and they knew all about XYZ who I knew a little bit but the only person I really liked was Salvador Dali and uh and so he was a really considered by artists by them they looked at you you know like if you what are you talking about Salvador Dali he's not an artist but I love surrealism and uh and so it just led from there you know and then uh while at art school i i was dj and i was working on the king's road and uh in a clothes shop which was really trendy that all the stars used to go to and um then on saturday afternoon we would go to a, a bar where my friend owned and downstairs where we all met and had cocktails and then i'd go home and then go back to the club across the road on the king's road and dj and then all my friends would come down while I was DJing so it was like a total immersion of creativity that I was surrounded by you know you had all of these artsy people like some of my friends were at the royal college and some were at this college that and but they were all quite artsy mm. and um my girlfriend who is now my wife uh who went to the same school as me she uh we both were sort of mixing in fields that we we um which which anybody had thought about 
would have said was not looking back was out of our depth because there was all these rich kids from everywhere, you know, coming and partying with us and et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we began. And that's how I started going to Camberwell. And then I remember um, there was, so people of the same sort of ilk tend to merge together. And I remember doing the first live drawing class and thinking these women, and uh, they, they had women with like, you know, stitches down them because they were the most, and roles, because they were the most uh, sort of aesthetically pleasing women to draw. And so we used to be in there and out there because to us, these, the, coming from where we came from, these weren't women that we'd like to draw, you know, and that's not a derogatory statement. But I remember we saw this, this woman, one woman who made the impression, and there was, there was a group of us, that, and it sounded like, you know, um, a, 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 a band of renegades. There was me, who was Afro-Caribbean, we had an African guy, we had an Italian guy, we had a Welsh guy, and we had an English guy. But the commonality between us is that we all came from working class background. And um, I remember this life class where this girl, absolutely beautiful, and she's made the whole room smell of whatever um, bath salt she was using at the time. And so me and my mate, well, I didn't know this, but it was break time. And I stayed in to just do a bit more extra drawing. And I looked around, everybody else had gone except the, you know, the, the English and the Irish and the Scots and everything else, which we all stayed there. And, and then we formed this bond to become really, and we became really good friends. And, and that was our art school. And then we all partied together and, and stuff like that. But yeah, and then we just went on and, you know, and Chris Sullivan, who's had a band called Blue Rondo, a la Turk, uh, a zoot suit band. Um, I remember one, one year, one Christmas, he said to me, Neil, because I played trombone, he said to me, Neil, do you fancy coming on tour of us? And I said, and I think I was in my second year, and this was about December time. And he said, we're going on tour. He'd gone to St. Martin's by the time to do fashion. And I was still at Canberra doing my, my, my three-dimensional design, specialising in silversmithing at Canberra. And um, he basically said, you, rang me up and said, do you want to come to, to Scotland with us on a tour? I said, yeah, why not? And I remember, and this is how off the cuff we were. And so I remember learning my part, going up to Scotland in a toilet with a drummer who was constantly been sick because he had stage fright of, of the time. Every time he sort of going on stage, he was just making himself sick. So, and I was learning my part in, in the toilet of this, of this, this train going up to Scotland. And it was absolutely amazing. And so from there, you know, everybody was so arty and people didn't care what you did because you were just, you know, seen as arty, arty. That sounds fantastic. It's a very similar, sort of, strangely, it's a very similar story to my own father's. He was, his, um, his old man, he, so he was up from up in Harrow and his old man worked in the Kodak factory. Um, my grandfather and his mum worked in a, as a cook in a school and he had, so he was at the, the Catholic boys school and um, he didn't know, but somebody put him forward for art college for Harrow art school uh, at 15. Um, and he thinks it was the nun that taught the art classes, a, a woman called sister Petronella, who a young Irish nun who was herself a very fine I think she was like a typesetter or something along those lines, but she had seen in my dad this skill and she'd put him through, she'd got him it because he said his parents would never have done it. Like, yeah, exactly. Would, yeah. would never have, they would have never presumed that people like them could get to somewhere like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he, and then he, yeah, he, he rolled with all the same, the same part of town as you, I think, uh, you know, up, mm -hmm. up in the West End of London. It was, and uh, ended up at the BBC. But, um, yeah, it's really interesting. So, so you, so you end up being a silversmith and three-dimensional designer, and then you end up being a teacher. My dad, likewise, ended up 
being a graphic, a commercial graphic designer, and then ends up being a teacher. So that's quite strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so wh- why teaching in the end? And then, and then how because, do you, and then how did you? Yeah, this journey towards architecture, I suppose. Why, why from well, silversmithing to architecture? Well, what happened is I wanted to be a sculptor to begin with. Yeah. Uh, just let, I'm just putting that one out there. And I did, I, I dabbled in fine art, but I'd always done youth work. Yeah. And working with young people. So I lived on the estate and there's a youth club on the estate. And what was the estate, I, by the uh, way? Patmore Estate. It's, it's huh. in off Wandsworth Road. Yeah, you yeah. know it? Uh, well, I know of it, yeah. Um, yeah. Go on, keep going. So uh, Patmore Estate. Uh, and it's a beautiful building, looking back on it now. Yeah. And um, they've got some absolutely fantastic... I mean, I think this was built at a stage when uh, architects really cared about, uh, cared a bit more about social housing because they were really well designed. Mm. All of the houses and, and the way it was laid out, you know, it was really, really well designed. You had green areas, you had a a, 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 a sports area in the middle and yeah. round the sides there was loads of greenery and stuff so it was really really and you had and, and I've seen the same sort of architecture replicated around uh, London these uh, flats are really nicely divided up and if you see them they've got these white lines going between them that design divide the floors and it's sort of <laughs> marked out all of the windows and everything else. And it was beautiful architecture as opposed to just a, a flat facade with cladding on, on, on the windows and stuff like that, or around the windows. And it was made out of brick as well. So, uh, and the areas where, where you played on the grass were all quite nicely defined with the pathways going up the middle. And, you know, when you played run outs around there, you you could jump over the fence. Everybody learned how to one hand hop over the fence or, or jump over the fence and stuff like that. So it was a real experience living in, a, in, in, in this estate. And you had the inner circle of the estate and then you had the outer circle of the estate, sort of uh, houses, which are bigger flats and everything else. And they, it was built in view Looking back on it now, it was a really nice little sun trap at different places. Yeah. So um, uh, it was a real sort of architectural experience that you didn't know you were getting, but you were subliminally getting about design, et cetera, et cetera, when you lived there. So I was and, doing and, also, and, all, and also sort Sorry. of about, you know, as you were saying, about the, the, the quality of the architecture. It's not just about design but about a kind of relationship between the designer and the resident like it's as you say very generous it's very mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's like it's very egalitarian architecture it's very mm-hmm, mm-hmm. socially conscious which yes, must have yes. into it. because if you look at it the Patmos estate it's got a road like an s bend which goes through the estate mm. and then it's got the outer roads on the estate and then it's got lower housing mm. around near the centre and then as you go out to the peripheries they're taller buildings yeah. sort of thing and the, the S then became a racetrack <laughs> which you know, <laughs> you know many a cars ended up you know in the middle of the night you hear <laughs> smash on the corner where you know they became a sort of challenge to get around the S Bend as fast as you can. But uh, it was a really, really, really good community in, in that estate. And as I said, I worked in a youth centre, which was, wasn't far away. And it was, I was always drawn to working with young people because they, or younger than me. So they always gave you energy. They always come out with the same things, but think that they're original. And it's like, a, you know, like what we did. It's exactly the same format. I mean, now it's switched over to digitalization, but it's still the same format uh, that, that, that think they're original, that they're coming up with all of these groundbreaking ideas and ways to stuff you and ways to be sarcastic and whatever with you. But they're still the same, it's still the same format or the print that they originally did. So I was always connected with young people. So 
when I was running nightclubs. So I left art school and I had a chance to go to Brighton to do my master's because um, some of my friends got in the Royal College and stuff. And I thought, let me just see if I can do my master's. But at the same time, I started to run my own nightclub on a Monday night. And it was a choice of, so one of my mates, so my brother did, he did an education degree down at Avery Hill. My other mate did a, a, a psychology degree. And so we was all, you know, working class guys, but we all played, but we did different degrees. So one did a science education. I did the art. And the arty one was always seen as the crazy one for some peculiar reason, you know. And then I had the opportunity to go either go to Brighton to do my master's or run a nightclub, my own club on a Monday night on the King's Road. And it was the opportunity that I couldn't give up. And, and, and I didn't do my master's ever, you know, which hasn't harmed me, really. So... Um, I ran this nightclub, became really successful on a Monday night, and I had to, I had to do something in the middle of the week. So I thought, let me just do part time teaching. Yeah. And so I um, applied to be a part time teacher, and or, or no technician, should I say? And I had this fantastic old boy who was so uh, pedantic about engineering and making things and I remember he taught me how to kneel on a lathe and this was in this Catholic boys school where if any kid did anything wrong they would have to um, do two pages out of the bible write two pages out of the bible and I thought myself my god this is so bad anyway this 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 this, this old boy as I call him he, he said, look, let me show you how to mill. And I, I was this technician like his gopher. And, and it was only two days a week because Monday I didn't choose to work because I ran my club on Monday night and I had to prepare. Tuesday I was recovering from uh, Monday night. Wednesday, Thursday and Friday I would, no, Wednesday and Thursday I'd work. And then they got me working Friday. But Friday I didn't really want to work because it was too near the weekend because I could party again until you know, and um, and so what happened is he showed me how to kneel, and I remember the, the it resonated in my ear. And he was at the same time he was modernised. You know, one of those Morris Minor sort of cars with the wooden bits on it, like the estate, yeah, where yeah, yeah. you know. And he was he was revamping that, and he said, "Neil, let me show you how to kneel." And he showed me how to kneel, and the first kneel I did. And it, and, and it still resonates now. He said, Neil, that's a pig's ear. You know what a pig's ear looked like? <laughs> and he took me and showed me what a pig's ear looked like. And then I practiced and practiced how to kneel, you know. It, so that was a really good experience. And then from then on, I was teaching and running clubs. And that was my passion, teaching, running clubs, DJing. And the running, the, the, the club, the, the kids, will always see me coming in this flash car and they just connected with me. And so from then on, it was just grew. And then it came to a space when I had my own kids where, you know, uh, the real life has to take, you know, where, where you had to get your house, get more of a, a, a steady wage coming in. And then, you know, the, the, the formalities of life started to take over. But in the, in the meantime, I was still, I started to, design different rooms and parts of my friend's houses and I was specializing on lighting and the reason I specialized in lighting there was a guy called John Cullen who had a lighting shop off the King's Road and I remember walking home for, as a shortcut and I used to go in this shop because I was fascinated by the lighting and I used to read his books and he was a real sort of epicurean of lighting and he opened it my eyes to how you integrate lighting into houses as opposed to just have the one filament bulb in the middle. Yeah. And that was sort of my start of looking at people's houses and telling them and educating my friends about lighting, architecture, design, and then it began from there. Oh, fabulous. And then you brought this into the classroom. You, you decided that... 
What was yeah, what was because... what was absent in your in your students' education that you thought needed it needed that architecture was the answer? Um, so what happened is I was doing uh, a bit of teaching in this school, that school, and then I got the opportunity to work in a school in Greenwich, and I live in Battersea. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to be spending my life traveling on a train mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to get there and then traveling my life back and getting back. And then an opportunity came up in this girls' school in, um, in Tulse Hill. St. Martin's in the field. And so I taught in a boys' school, and then I was in mixed co ed, and then this job came up in St. Martin's in the field, and I thought, wow, uh, let me try this. And then Victoria Thornton launched London Open House and connected with the school. And it's like usually what they do is they send an email to, or send a a message to the school, somebody prints it off, sticks it in someone's nose and say, you're interested? And they say, no, I'm too busy. And they, they don't really have interest. But this one, it was um, architects engaging with young people. And I saw how you could teach product design, engage with young people at the same time and not let them make bird boxes. So when I first went to this school, everybody was making bird boxes. And I thought to myself, bird boxes, this is part of my language, shit, you know? <laughs> and I said to them, how, you, how many of you study birds or like birds? And this is the girls school, and they're saying, well, not really. I said, you know, do you know anything about how birds nest, et cetera, et cetera? No. And I said, well, why are we doing this project? And then when the architect, and then it, everything happened for a reason, the architect, um, from Pernard and, and Passard, they were Victoria's chosen architect. And even, and then there was a guy who I'm even in contact with now, years later, a guy called Wayne Head. And because I always thought architecture was a, you know, a stush sort of really highbrow, not for me. And I can never connect with them. Although I was designing some of my friends' houses and flats and the council house that we lived in, I transformed it when my parents went back. Uh, um, I met this guy called Wayne Head. Is that Curl, Terrell, Terrell and Head now. Have you heard of him? Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, so Wayne, I saw this guy and he had, uh, uh, he had, a, um, he had this jacket on that was Com de Gasson. And I thought to myself, wow. And I was always into fashion and style. I thought, wow, this guy's got a Conde Gasson jacket on. He must be really trendy. And then I just, you know, connected with him. And then the whole thing, London Open House, Open City. Then we started winning awards. With the, well, they transformed the ideas of the kids that we had. For making bird boxes, I was connected to a glass company. And we started making stuff out of glass. This is before, obviously, health and safety took the biggest sort of, you know, axe to any sort of, you know, creativity using stuff that might, might remotely, you know, cause a splinter, you know, <laughs> on somebody's, you know, God forbid, little finger, you know, sort of thing. And I remember this girl, and she's an art architect now, Cindy. And and she made this fantastic glass sculptured table of different layers. And the, 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 the guy from the moderator came in and looked at it and said, wow, we've never seen anything like it. And then from there on, things just developed with London Open House. And then the school I'm at now, some 17 years later, um, that school, uh, I went there only if I could teach architecture or get bring architecture into the curriculum mm -hmm. and that's how I, I that's when i went to the interview i said look i can bring in london open house architecture and then from there on the journey sort of officially started with a guy called mark warren who's who who, who is my first i call him i mean i had other architects at martin's in the field and other 
schools before that, but Mark Warren was my first official architect. He, I call him my first baby. So he, I'm still in connect with him, connection with him today. I go to, he's got two kids. I've been to the christening, I've been to the wedding, the christening, and he's designed these fantastic basketball courts in, um, in multi-purpose courts in Brixton. They're really colourful, absolutely amazing courts that he's designed. And um, then Joseph Henry come, came and um, Joseph is now a superstar. And then what happened is every year architects started coming from uh, and wanting to be architects from non-traditional background. So the white kids never came to me because they had roots into architecture. So I'd hear, oh, so-and-so is, is at this school of architecture is doing this. But it was people from non-traditional backgrounds of all different diasporas that would come to me. And then I would help them with open house, access into this uh, practice, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it, it grew and developed, really. Excellent. So what does the curriculum look like? Like, what, how, how do you... Do you mean? What, well, like, how do you teach it? I mean, I'm guessing it's off the national curriculum in some degree. Or does it fit within the product design curriculum? And 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 like, how do you how do you actually teach it? Because I know how I teach it badly. No, mm. I um, <laughs> <laughs> like. What do you do? Do you set them design projects? Do you give them a site? Do you, or do you start them thinking about? I don't know. Trying to create a space that's like an emotion or like a song or. Well, the, the thing about the good thing about this school I'm at, they gave me free range, yeah. and um, and you remember I said to you about being a maverick, and if you if you act like a maverick, people think oh, after they tell you the things that the the like my boss said to me one day he said to me Neil, I'd love for you to manage you, <laughs> you know, so and and if you're if, if you got that sort of inspiration and vision. The, the little details of the national curriculum, you know, they go out the window a little bit. But don't tell DFP that because if not, they'll be down on us like a ton of bricks. And we'll be crossing the I's and dotting the T's, you know, and, 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 and weaning all creativity out of the curriculum in terms of maths and English and all stuff like that, which they, you know, have done now. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on. But what it is, is I started entering competitions. That is the secret, getting kids entering things like London Open House. And now our kids are entering something called uh, Design, Design, Lon Design Future London, which is run by George Clark, the Mayor of London, and um, his trust, the Moby. So when you enter that, that gives you a certain amount of legitimacy because then you can teach. I mean, I'm not an architect, but I get architects to come in and deliver. But what I teach them is basic architecture, like perspective and looking at infrastructure, looking at sustainability, looking at biomimicry, looking at, looking at all the things I love, parametric architecture, and connecting with all of these different types of design so that kids are infused by it and they don't just see it as an exercise in having to do a isometric drawing on an isometric paper and then after producing a CAD drawing and then producing the package out of a laser cutter and saying, look, what I've done, that's really good. I've finished and I've used all the material processes on the tick box for the syllabus. It sounded a bit robotic, but that's what it is. So why is this important? I mean, why, why is it important to teach To teach architecture like what what is i mean obviously the non-traditional we can get come to the non-traditional background thing I, I also want to come to this point that you made and i was reading a, a an interview interview with you from somewhere else where you talked about not stem but steam and i thought this was brilliant so not mm -hmm. science technology engineering mathematics but science technology english art and mathematics and i thought this is engineering and mathematics yeah engineering art um yeah S-T-E-A-M is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. 
Uh, is it not English? I thought yeah, that was English. not English. No, no, uh, no, no, no. no. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. but but sticking the art in the middle of it is a really interesting. Yeah. And it comes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think we we overlook in the scientific field is the fact that mm -hmm. creativity is inherent to the scientific and mathematical process. Like, mm -hmm. if you are a scientist, you have to be able to design experiments. You have to be able to come up with a creative hypothesis to deal with a problem or an issue or a, 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 a gap in a gap in human knowledge, and then you have to design an experiment. That that is an inherently creative act, and so creativity in the scientifically minded is actually what makes a great scientist. A great mm -hmm. scientist, yeah, totally. And and so and so you might have brilliant ideas, but if you if you can't, or you might be able to identify problems but if you can't design a solution you're just going to remain a, a a gopher in a in a science lab and the guy that's got the flair the einstein or the stephen hawking's they're the ones that get so i think it's really interesting and art it might be a really good way of helping scientists be better at science you're absolutely absolutely right because but what we've got we've got a system at the moment which is designed by a bunch of etonians who have had so much privilege beyond all belief. And they, their whole idea is to still socially engineer the divide between the people like them and the people like us. And that is what it is. And that's why I lecture on power, control, and money. And, and that's, what, that's all they're about. And you look throughout history, they have this elitist privilege and it's entitlement that they think they have to the wealth and this is why architecture is in such a bit of a bit of a quandary at the moment in terms of you know students are uh, doing an architecture architecture do degree part one and part two coming out with a hundred grand debt and then only can earn 24 25 grand a year you know that tells you it's looking back at the systems that which have been developed where architecture was for the privilege and their parents or whoever trust funds gave them the liberty to experiment and fulfill their ambitions. But, you know, in the real world, uh, 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 diversity is, is what we're talking about, is needed because, as I was saying the other day, you know, I come from a council estate. I know what we need in terms of housing stock. I know what we need in terms of space. I know what we need in terms of uh, value added, in terms of improvement of life, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you see all the adverts on TV with these American double-sided, double-fronted fridges. Half of them can't get out in the lift of a, of a block of flats. They can't do a 90 degree bend in, in, up the stairwell, you know, but yet still we've got these privileged architects who come along and tell us, um, oh, I've got this idea and da 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 da, and it looks really good. They have got no idea of how the people they are designing for live mm -hmm. because they've never been connected. I mean, it's totally understandable, but this is why we need diversity because people from other diasporas can understand how to design. Well, I'll make this a bit bigger and I might do this a bit different. And I know my mum and my dad want this sort of space, but it's all in their minds from a lived experience. Mm. And it's from the DNA of life as opposed to the, the thought mm. process that they've had through this school, that school, that school, but never actually pick up a, an actual um, act to, to break down or you know, dig a hole, you know, never use the kango in, yeah. in anger, you know, and stuff like, you know, and stuff like that. Well, I think it is. I mean, you say it's not their fault, but we've had, a, you know, quite a long time of architectural education and quite a lot of people arguing for better representation in architecture. And it hasn't happened. It, it simply hasn't happened. And there's nothing that stops an architect going and trying to get to know people who live in confined circumstances, straightened finances, 
you know, single parent households or people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from ethnic minority backgrounds. You, you know, it doesn't, it wouldn't be the most difficult job to not spend all your time amongst people exactly like yourself so that you never experience anything else. I mean, for me, architecture, that has always been the joy of architecture is, is, is that conversation that you have when you go to, to visit a place where you're going to do a project and you get to talk to people who aren't exactly the same as you surely surely that's what we've got to be doing anyway um but don't forget these are the same people that would go to india bali blah 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 australia da, 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 da. they travel oh we've traveled the world we did backpacking they did backpacking with all their mates in bali they did backpacking in australia touching bases with all of their mates who look like them in Australia, they never went to and find out what the Aborigines causes and et cetera in Australia. They would go to Peru and go to a nice place in Peru. They would go to Central America, et cetera, et cetera. They ne- they're, they're never out of their comfort zone. Their comfort zone is, oh, I might go down to Brixton and buy a bit of weed from some guy who looked a bit dodgy. And... <laughs> Suddenly, you know, they're out their comfort zone. No, <laughs> Brixton's been transformed. You know, uh, life did, has been transformed. I did wonder, I'm coming back to the Patmore estate, what did your parents think about the Patmore estate coming from the Caribbean? Which part of the Caribbean did they come from? Barbados. Barbados. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, how lovely. Yeah. My, my, my sister... It's called Little England Barbados. So they, they had a lot of English-isms about them, should we say. Yeah. But... I mean, and, and I remember reading one of these little books that when my dad was, it, they'd all gone back to Barbados. And uh, and it was so sad. My dad had the book still, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. You know, the little sayings that he, he, he had. And I remember looking at that and thinking, how angry must he have been coming from the Caribbean, being told that you're welcome here. You know, now we've got Pretty Patel, who's, you know, put up a a, 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 a a wall to stop people getting citizenship and whatever. Um, and you were told no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Literally, I saw it in life. It's so sad, you know. So, and they, if you go to Barbados, it's, it's everyone says it's so English. Is it? Yeah, well, it's one of the most English of the islands in the Caribbean. Yeah, they call it little. It's got Nelson Column there. <laughs> Fantastic. A, a, a mini version of it, obviously. <gasps> of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I bet it's nice, though. I bet it's nice. But this, um, yeah. So this, I mean, did your parents find? Because clearly, the Patmore Estate or your your the background the. The landscape of our childhood is, it affects the way that we think about the world, mm-hmm. and it must have been like quite a profound influence on you. Was it was it a good place to be a family? When I grew up, yes, it was. A, it was you know everybody knew everybody, and it was at a stage when, and it still happens in smaller communities where my mum would clean the stairs. We only lived in a little block. Mansell House. It was only like one with ground floor, first floor, second floor. So everybody, the families had a Spanish family lived on top. And so we had a, an English family lived opposite, you know, real English family, older family. And then we had um, other families, but we were all mixed. And they were all the mums would clean the stairs. Once a week, they were cleaning it. In these little blocks, yeah. and everybody, yeah, everybody spoke to everybody, and it was really, really a nice, you know, nobody judged anybody for who they were. And I remember we we had this uh, our neighbour opposite us. She suffered from Parkinson's, and 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 it was quite it was quite bad because she couldn't talk. But our mum, because my mum was a nurse, she made us go and help her at various times, you know. And so we on the so we had an affinity with people of different uh, dis- disabilities just because we understood this woman who you know suffers from Parkinson's and she would 
ask us to go and get some milk for her when me and my brother were younger and stuff. And so we'd help her, help her down the stairs and stuff like that, you know. And, 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 and that's the sort of community that we grew up with. Mm-hmm. And it was a real lovely community that we got. And we had this mad, um, a mad uh, Spanish guy who was a DJ. I mean, I suppose I'm, I must have got my... And, and he would have his speakers out on a Saturday morning blaring out music, you know, and everyone knew he was a DJ. It was just such a brilliant community. Wonderful. So I want to go back to this idea of uh, expanding architectural education to people from mm. non, non-traditional backgrounds. How do you do that? How how do we like so obviously teaching it at school? So I'm taking it your school your sort of school that, that you are a teacher in is a standard comprehensive secondary school, co ed secondary school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, and so you, so you encounter lots of kids from not you know ordinary backgrounds, working class kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, kids we have fifty six different dialects in our school. We have rich kids in there. I mean, we have the full length of and breadth of our social mobility and not social mobility in our school. So we've got the ultimate rich to the ultimate poor in our school to people from our displaced families, et cetera, et cetera. And so our school, I would say, is an exemplar school for um collaboration, community, cooperation, in terms of diversity that you'll ever find yeah. in, in the whole of England. But your curriculum can't do it all. So how do, you, how do you expand education? What needs to be done to architectural education? Like, where do we start? As I said at the beginning, like, when I went to university to study architecture, I didn't really know anything about architecture. I'd done a bit of building work with my dad. I'd done design work. He was a designer, so I'd been around drawing boards, and you know, and uh, you know, he was a very, very creative, artistic man. So we were constantly around that, but that—that's not architecture. Um, certainly, wasn't the architecture that I ended up finding. So, how do you, how do you, yeah, how do you do it? How do you broaden it? And then, how do you broaden it in the profession as well? Because there's there, there's then another disconnect, which is that you take such a long educational process so you take kids from non-traditional backgrounds often enough from not very wealthy backgrounds and then you put them in architecture school and it grinds them down and then when they get to the profession there's less access for them as well from from particularly um you know poorer kids so there's all of these barriers like how do we actually get over them I think what we have to do is we start from, like, so there's various programs that I'm involved in and people involved in, we're involved in. I do celebrating architecture, which is at primary school. And we don't necessarily use the word architecture. It's design, creativity. Mm-hmm. And, and then you move it on there. And it's to bring out the creativity in people. Mm-hmm. That is the main access point that you have to get into their mind Mm -hmm. it's you can make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes Mm -hmm. everybody's talking about framework 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 Mm -hmm. so these frameworks that have been devised in every subject are to minimize the amount of failure Mm -hmm. and it's to deal with people's mental health as well because if you design frameworks 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 and suddenly you come up against something and you fail, that's going to be even more of a sort of a implosion at a third. Yeah. If it was, if you were failing and growing and failing and growing. So it's a bringing creativity into the schools and say, yes, you can fail, you can do this. And then just get them uh, ideally designing, designing, designing. And then... For example, we've designed, designed a program called Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Architecture and Me. And it's basically aimed at non-traditional people and tradition, if you want to get involved, uh, to think about wearable architecture. So all the kids know I love my Louis. They know I love my Gucci. And this program was devised because one of my young ladies uh, who 
is an lo- absolutely fantastic young lady. She was doing textiles and she wasn't getting on with the group that she was in because they were a, a bit more privileged, privileged in title. So the teacher sent her to me and said, look, it's the same syllabus. Do, do it, do it with me. So I've got and her folder was absolutely amazing. So she got top marks for the folder. And then she said, I'm just going to go to a couple of art schools and stuff and see what I can do. And um, she went somewhere and they just said to her, you'll never become, she didn't even take her work with her. I suppose it was just the questions she was asking weren't the right questions that they're used to hearing. And just said, you'll never become an architect. Oh, sorry, a designer or get into interior architecture, what she wanted to do. So she came back really shattered. So what we have to do is make sure that people who are in places of position are knowledgeable and can have an affinity with the people that are approaching them. That's number one. And to educate them that not everybody's entitled. So the people who are teaching have got to realise that you know, they can identify entitled people easy because they look like them, talk like them, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one narrative we have to change. The next narrative that, the next part that came of it is when I said to look, leave it to me, I think of something. So it came out of what I wear and the mere fact that Mark, who I used to teach and I told you about, remember, yeah, yeah. He used to come. To, he used to come to me and say, "Sir, can I cut this material on your laser cutter? And can I do this? Can I do this?" I said, "Yeah, just come and do it." And then I, I found more of my students would come back to me and ask me to cut material or get material, and I would make sure I'd have a bit more material so that they could work with, because they can afford to book a time to laser cutter, get the material, which is really expensive. Yeah. And all of the bits that make it really privileged to actually do architecture, mm-hmm. you know, they would come to me and I would try and sort them out of, out of different architectural budgets that I managed to wangle out of competitions in school. And so that is another area. And so GLAM grew out of, and so I said, when I did GLAM, I wanted that's, to be that's a good, that's plan. Gucci, that's Gucci, Louis Vuitton. Architecture and me. Yeah. And I want it to be a level playing field. So I said, everybody has got to get stuff out their recycle bin. And it was coincidentally in lockdown where you couldn't go out and buy. So I said, everybody has got to get stuff out their recycle bin. And that's the even playing field. You can't go out and then, so we just replicated and spread that on. You can't go out and buy a piece of light gathering acrylic which you're going to place here and it look, wow. You've got to make sure if you want to do something like that, you make sure you've got something out your recycle bin that you could, you know, foil or, you know, you know, you've got to be innovative. So it becomes a flat plan field. So the people who are really innovative and talented, they're, they're, they're thinking of everything. But the people who have been entitled to it, who could go out and get the flash material and everything else, suddenly you've got to start thinking of how I can make this look better than just, or make it look like something. And that's where Professor Harriet Harris from the Praxis Institute in New York, she said, we was on a, she came and did a glam of us when it was a Zoom workshop. And she said, so we did it as a Zoom workshop in lockdown. And then it just blew up from then. And, 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 and Professor Harriet Harris said to me, Neil, you know what you've done? I said, what? She said, you've created a Trojan Hall. So, fooling the kids, or not necessarily fooling the kids, but getting the kids to think that they're designing something. And next thing, we've got architects, we've got uh, fashion designers, we've got this, that, and working with them. And next thing they know, they're producing a piece of wearable architecture. Yeah, yeah. And But if you had said to them, you're going to do a piece of wearable architecture. And you're thinking, no, you know, because you're thinking about scale, proportion, you know, uh, the end user, problem solving, all of the things that you as an architect have to think about, the end user. We've got them to think about all of that, but we haven't packaged it 
as you're doing an architectural project. Yeah. And that's what is, and that's what we have to do. We have to create more Trojan horses and then the talent will come out. And once you've got the talent out, you've got to get people who are receptive and who can acknowledge the, the, the sort of creativity that these non-traditional people are bringing to the table. Mm. And it's been statistically proven that you, if you have diversity in any field, it enhances that particular, particular field. Really good. So, I just want to f- finish on 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 a one other question, which is: What would an increase in inclusion, representation of a more broad spectrum of people, but particularly, I think, foregrounding experiences of kind of what we might call ordinary people and everyday lives? What might that do for architecture, like our experience of architecture? What might it do for our cities? What might it do for our towns? Like, how how might they change? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is if we, because we're always metamorphosizing and changing the demographics and changing of areas all the time, um, what we have to understand, we're, we're plateaued at a certain area where certain places uh, 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 have got bigger communities of this. But as I said to you earlier on, we've got to be careful of the people who have the power because they're the people who are dispersing these indigenous people. So, for example, around the elephant in the castle and in that area, at this precise moment, they've built all these flashy houses and flats. And they're only going to be occupied by young people who have got money from their parents or wherever. And the, and what it does, it's a knock-on effect. It, it eases, the, eases the budget for the actual uh, local authority, eases, meaning that you get less people social dependent on you, et cetera, et cetera. So that is why they're doing it. But if we can... Because, uh, young, people, because young people don't get so sick and they don't have children... Yeah. And they don't use yeah. schools and they don't use doctors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And all of those tick boxes that you've just done, which mm. you've seen. It, some, I said this to an architect and he said, is this a conspiracy theory? I said, well, look at the facts. You know, look at the facts yourself. And then you've got the private schools if they decide to stay there. Mm. But most of them go back to the Shire County. So uh, your question is, it, it is, why do we need it? We need it because we need people to be in control, uh, in control of how they live, mm-hmm. how, what they do, where they go, what they want in those infrastructures of their communities. They don't want just to have nice little pathways that are uplit with nice little lights and, and stuff like that. That may be great but it might not be a priority. If you've got kids and you've got families, you want places where they can go play, relax. You want the amenities near them. You, you can educate them about sustainability because you can say, right, we're going to, for this point, we're going to have our electric cars. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. You can educate people that way, change them, their, 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 their mode of thinking in certain respects but you have to cater for what they want. You have to put those infrastructures in. You have to design the buildings that will take the double-sized fridge, the American fridge, you know. You have to design the buildings uh, and the houses and the flats which are more conducive to people coming out, talking, sharing experiences, you know. And I say one of the major things is you have to make sure that you have people designing for people who want to break bread with each other and as you know from most diasporas around the world breaking bread is one of the biggest things that we do we sit down we eat we talk we break we share food and once you're doing that you understand your other uh, fellow human and you're creating communities you're not making just pods for people to live in and then move out and sell and for it to go up and down or wherever the the, the, the case may be so that's why we need people with different mentality different ideology different uh sense of community so one of my kids today 
Asian young man, we're designing a part of the Royal Dock. And he said, do you know what we could do, sir? And he was doing his presentation and he said, um, what we could do, we make a bigger house, but have three families in one house. Now I thought to myself, that is absolutely fantastic because from his diaspora, from his knowledge, he may have two or three families in his house. But from an English person, uh, that, there's nothing more worse, more, more fearful than having two other families in your family house, you know? But to him, that's normal. Yeah. So we might be able to design just slightly bigger houses with different areas configuration. And this guy said, yes, some people do want three families in a house. Yeah. I think that's a really it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it comes back to this. So, Go on, after you, Neil. No, no, as I was saying, so it just opened my mind because of this guy. And I gave him loads of information. I, I was telling him about half a house, whereas in, 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 in certain parts of the world, they build half a house. So when they get the rest of the money, they can build the other half. I said, we could do that here. You see, and it's just getting people to think differently instead of I want to buy this house and it's my house and I own the property, it is a lot, and I'm going to dig down, build up, and I'm going to have my garden with da 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 bam, tick that box. I, you see, I, I take an even more cynical view, of view, and you can might call it conspiratorial as well, conspiracy theorist view, which is, a, and, and architects, I think, have a huge part are a huge part of this story which is that it's good for capitalism and it's good for our economic system to get everybody living in their own house because it's mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. good for the city of london basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't actually think people want to live like that but we've become accustomed like even here it's multi-generational mm -hmm. living mm -hmm. shared communal living these things are, are natural i think to the human species this is what mm -hmm. we do but we've been persuaded through marketing and lying that we, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we want to live in this kind of horrific, money-orientated, isolated, alienated, unhappy way. And, and it, it clearly isn't working. And, I, I, the, and architects have gone along with this. They've actually made it more likely to occur. They build the, ter the shit housing uh, to... to mm -hmm. They, you know, the terrible stuff that they throw up in central London. I mean, you're down, you know, down near Battersea when you walk, drive into Battersea. Next oh, week, my really. Lord, yeah. 9am, yeah. Total joke. I mean, it genuinely, yeah. it looks like Pyongyang, but rubbish. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> well, what they've done is they've given... I mean, who given... trained these architects to design those buildings? Well, the thing is, is that you know, it was never designed for the indigenous people because I lived just across the track from that. And what you, and what you understand, this was prime land. Yeah. And so did it. And this land has been sold two or three times over where Battersea Power Station is, is, uh -huh. is, I get it, where you're talking about. And I remember Maggie Thatcher once said it was going to be a theme park and it worked out that it was going to be 36,000 ins and outs now this road can't hold at the best of times because it's an arterial route, route route straight to the south circle it can't hold loads of people you've got the dog home bridge which is a bridge there's only two lanes on it or three lanes on it you know so but what it was it was in 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 london and england we've got this mentality of handing it over to the private sector the developer yeah. because the private sector can't afford to bear the cost. And so because the private sector is only money orientated, we get stuff. And the architect goes along with the developer because they want to make money. Yeah. The major, we call them star architects, you know, for want of better words. Our star architects go along with the developer and put some spin on it. I mean, you see Frank Derry's place in Battersea Power Station. Have you seen it yet? No, Frank he's Geary's been, he's, done Battersea Power Station. He designed a block, a, a, a thing in, in Battersea Power Station. Have a look at it. You know, you've got Foster, you've got all the star architects that have done something there. So it looks like, a, 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> you can see it. Yeah. yeah. It's awful. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, that's, that's they're put, it's like somebody's vomited and they've just plopped it in there and said, there you go. You know, and everybody from overseas is going to play a million pounds to be in this St. Gary's uh, building, you know. And then you've got Foster's down the road. You've got all the sparky techs with their nice little, but there's no continuity, yeah. you know. And, and I had a big, one of my biggest angst was when they first advertised for the, the development of it. And the, there was no people of colour on that billboard. You really? had... And they, yeah, and they sold it to Malaysia, wherever, in China. There was no people of colour on that billboard. And that billboard was up for years. That weird. Yeah. Well, it's not weird. It's just, you know, what they want. You know who they want to attract. You know, you know where one bedroom that's going for a million, plus the garage, plus this, plus that, whatever. You know. I mean, apparently, Sting's got a place in there now. And, you know, all these different higher profile people have got places in there and then there's a I think it's a five star hotel on the corner and stuff like this and then there's another place on the corner that's got a flat that's worth 10 million you know this is this is what has happened amazing isn't it? and this is where yeah, they just give it over because you know this government and subsequent government just want to let the private sector make money for them or well, whatever. I'm going to be even more conspiratorial now. There is something called the Section 106 Agreement, which you need to look up, which is a, a proportion of the commercial sale value of any commercial development gets given to the local authority to do kind of social good, infrastructural development, you know, mm -hmm. build parks, mm -hmm. zebra crossings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that money goes missing. That's my guess. As a lot of money goes mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. local authority mm -hmm. council and civil servants' hands, my guess is that that's what's happening. I, mm -hmm. If it mm -hmm. looks like bribery, it's probably bribery. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and the other thing is, is what you've got to be aware of, is a council, Wandos is really good at doing this, selling off all the garages. Oh, really? Yeah, so they're selling off all those little bits of land yeah. that were belong to the estate. And letting developers build on them. Yeah. And that's and, and that's what we come down to. And and, and don't we get everybody says, I've got to eat, I've got to eat. But you know, it's hard. It is really hard because I was on a selection committee for Thames Mead. And I'm saying to people, I was in the belly of the devil, of the beast, because I saw these developers. We had to come down from five to five, from ten to five developers. And when I, I mean, I was the only person. I was the only person of colour male on this selection committee. And I, I may never be invited on another one in my lifetime, but I've seen how they operate. And I, so I said to, I was saying to um, a couple of the, the the people, the architects proposing it. I said, do you realise uh, Thames Mead Town has a football club and it's part of the Ishmael League because I love sport? No. They didn't have a clue about the area. Yeah. Did you know it was called Little Nigeria? What, Thames Mead is? They did that. Yeah, Little Nigeria. Look it up. Well, it, I think it's uh, Nigerians or African diaspora are uh, occupied somewhere in the region, 42%. The other is English, and then it trickles down to um, nationality. Have a look. Look at the statistics. It's called Little Nigeria. Fantastic. But the, but the developers didn't even know that. No, no. no. So if, if you had, and then the other thing is, is when you going for procurement and when you're down for a job don't just get one black person or one asian person or one person of a different diaspora to be on your team and then put them forward to do a little speech so that if you get it and this is the fact so when you get it you think yeah we got it right you go and do the survey 
you know, and this is, this is what we've boiled down to. You know, you do the survey, you do the legwork. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm an architect. Uh, yeah, but, you know, just leave it to us. We know what we're doing. And, and this is, you know, so the architects have got to carry some of the blame as well because, they're, 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 as I said to you, they come, a lot of them, 90% of architects or is it 80% of architects comes from wealthy families? Yeah, or, or of that region. And that's all they know. And mm -hmm. all they know inherently is to treat people like they're on holiday and uh, they've gone to Sandy Lane and they think they're in the heart of Barbados, but they're in the richest part of Sandy Lane uh, and they think they're friends with the barman. But really, would you ever let the barman sit at your table and have a drink with you? No, you know? And, it, and it's like round where I live, you know, there's the, the whitest part of London is Bromley, then there's Numberware, and then there's Wandsworth. And you get all these people who, who, who uh, basically think they're friends with the UBS man. Would you ever let the UBS man come in your house and have dinner? No. So it, it, there's, there's a real, you know, di a disconnect between the people that have the control yeah. and the people who uh in the system trying to do the good yeah and that's what we got to bridge and that's what architecture has got to realize be like a football team man city arsenal you know chelsea liverpool and uh, all of these teams have fantastic uh by um a combination of different people and that's what makes them a brilliant T E A N. Yes, I agree. That's a lovely point to finish on. Neil, thank you so very much. That's all right. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. And hopefully you'll cut it up and make it sound even better. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've got to do. <laughs> Gosh, that was fantastic. All thanks to Neil for the inspiring conversation and great stories. Please see the podcast description for links to some other pieces Neil's collaborated on and to Homegrown Plus and his LinkedIn profile. And of course, please like, subscribe, follow and share Ears for Architecture here, there and everywhere. Cheers. Cheers.